We are the Why Mama Mamas and Papa. This is Merle, Ariba, and Richard. We are here to talk about the issues that you care about traffic, healthcare, education, and the environment, just to name a few, right here in Waimama and in the South Shore area where we all live. This podcast is a small look at big problems. We are all the same. We all want clean air and drinking water, safe food free of pesticides, and good schools for our children. Roads that we can travel on would be a bonus too. And when I see a problem, I want to point it out so we can all take some action to make it better for everyone. We welcome your concerns, problems, and issues to be read on air if you like. And if we can help solve any, we will give it a try. You can also contact us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Mamas, and on email at ymamamamas at gmail.com. And don't forget, you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Buzzsprout, and YouTube. You can expect new episodes on the 16th of every month. Though, full disclosure, sometimes it might be the 17th, like this month's episode. On our last show, we talked about money misspent by the Florida Department of Transportation. More on that in a minute. We will also be talking about traffic and population density in the South Shore area, the gender pay gap. Fran talked about why voting matters and how it's dangerous when people don't think it does. We also introduced a new segment called All About Science with Debbie. In her debut segment, she talked about how climate change will hurt Tampa Bay's economy. And finally, we had a wonderful interview with the CEO and founder of Enterprising Latinas, or Eli, Liz Gutierrez. Eli empowers women in Waimama to actively shape their own futures. Liz talked about some of the notable projects that Eli is undertaking to improve our quality of life right here in Waimama, including Waimama Now, which will improve downtown Waimama, and Arriba Transportation, or hot pink buses that will connect the people in Waimama to the heart buses so that the people of Waimama can have more mobility. I myself am a fan of the name. Here's a bit more about money misspent by Florida Department of Transportation from U.S. News published March 30th. You will be pleased to know Florida transportation officials say they've fined conduit state and local solutions who won the contract for the state's toll road system last year for $4.6 million for problems with overbilling and backlog of unpaid sun pass toll. It seems they have lived up to their terrible reputation. The Florida Department of Transportation announced the fine for conduit state and local solutions in a news release on Friday, April 19th. The agency also replaced its director of toll systems. The statement from Governor DeSantis are a further contrast from his predecessor, Rick Scott, who ordered an inspector general investigation into what went wrong last year, but for months defended their handling of the debacle. Last year, as Scott was running for a U.S. Senate seat, and it was revealed he was personally invested in conduit by owning at least $5 million in shares in a hedge fund that was heavily invested in the New Jersey-based company. Scott denied that his investment in Conduit had anything to do with FDOT awarding them the contract. This information was based off of an article in the Tampa Bay Times. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. Affordable housing, the shocking lack of fire stations in proportion to the population of the, in the South Shore area, how the Department of Education has spent $1 billion on charter school waste and fraud. Debbie is back with a segment on vaccinations. Fran will talk more about why people don't vote. And finally, we will be interviewing Hud Richards, the past president of the South County Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT. With hurricane season fast approaching, Hud has some great tips on how we can all be better prepared. Now it's time for News in Florida. I am breaking with our format. I saw this on Facebook and was so touched by this that I have to share it. It's about the first for-profit child detention center, which is located in Homestead, Florida. It holds children who were separated from their parents at the border. 
the detention center has only grown in capacity. This post was written by Joshua Rubin, titled Witness, Dornigil, Target, Homestead. Quote, there are some clouds in the sky as the sun threatens to rise over Homestead. Clouds hold the promise of a few breaks from the direct sun of South Florida at the prison camp just a few miles east of the Everglades. The children will be stirring soon, if they are not yet. Some of the staff who spend the night will make their way to their cars, parked in lots that are scattered around this makeshift prison camp, cobbled together from the ruins of an old Jobs Corp site abandoned when job corpse closed down, and then devastated by a hurricane or two. Signs of the devastation are everywhere apparent, and we have learned that the interiors are infested with mold that cannot be entirely scrubbed away. The children and staff have spent the night in these buildings. We don't always know what we are seeing. One of yesterday's mysteries was a drill in the middle of the broad field behind the fence. The field across from which and over the fence we have our best vantage. Yesterday was Easter Sunday and many people came from all over Florida to make witnessing this prison for refugee children as a part of their observance. And there was a drill in the middle of this field and they dug a big hole to help drainage perhaps. They put crowd control barriers around the new hole they use these barriers to channel the march of children from station to station in the camp. They place them as well near the gates and entrances to block the unauthorized access of outsiders like us who came to watch. A bigger mystery is where they are going to put the thousands plus more children we have been told they are expecting and may in fact be arriving. We have learned that they bring in new prisoners in the dark of the night. It is said that prisoners are more compliant at night, less prone to struggle and pan or panic. All these new prisoners, children, added to a place where, according to a report from months ago, the children are being packed like sardines. The sun is up now. We are watching. End quote. We will talk about the Homestead Detention Center in more detail in our next podcast, but you should all be aware that this is happening in our state. The detention center is unregulated and run by a private company, Caliburn International Corporation. Now, I'm going to be voicing my opinion here. The sad truth is that the people that have the most influence in this issue have had their consciences compromised by their ability to turn a profit. It just so happens that it comes at the expense of children and their families. There was an unregulated tent city in Tornillo, Texas that was shut down due to safety concerns for the children that were held there. The American Pediatric Association has found that detention is never safe for children's mental and physical well-being. The very concept of child detention goes against the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. It is wrong and we should not stand for it. We should let our U.S. and state senators and representatives know that they shouldn't stand for it either. For our actual News in Florida segment, we will be talking about affordable housing and the legislature stealing money from the fund. But before we do, we need to define some terms. What are housing trust funds? Housing trust funds are established sources of funding for affordable housing construction and other related purposes created by governments in the United States. Housing trust funds began as a way of funding affordable housing in the late 1970s. What are the benefits of funding affordable housing? Number one, affordable housing provides direct economic advantages to the community. Number two, this is because it's providing a diverse workforce. It accommodates individuals with different skills that are beneficial to the community. Number three, through affordable housing, the employees are going to be able to live near their respective employment centers, and this leads to a stronger labor force. Number four, that in turn promotes social and economic integration. Think about it, when you're not worried about rent or mortgage, you can shop at the small businesses in your area. The people in the community are able to invest in the community and that is what allows the community to thrive. The Florida State Legislature didn't get the memo, apparently. Maybe this year the legislature will stop swiping the money earmarked for Florida's affordable housing. This is an excerpt from an article by Lord Dunkelberger, February 8, 2019. 
quote, scrambling to pay rent or find affordable housing is a daily reality for many of Florida's poorest residents. Yet affordable housing is not at the top of Florida's legislature's to-do list, end quote. According to 2017 data from the University of Florida's Schimberg Center for Housing Studies, over one million low-income households pay more than half their income for housing. Then you know they're not able to spend that money on small businesses. The poorest Floridian families, or the very low-income families, are earning less than $26,000 a year. And if they're spending half of their income on housing, they have around 13000 per year to spend on whatever else they might need. Apartment rentals and mortgage payments are high in Tampa. We have not even considered other expenses like a car, utilities, food, and what two children will need. Despite those challenges, affordable housing is not a top priority for the Florida legislature. It's actually quite the opposite. In fact, since 2001, Florida lawmakers have rated an affordable housing trust fund for some $2.2 billion, shifting much of the housing money to other state programs. Last year, the legislature took $182 million from the affordable housing trust fund, citing the need to increase state spending on school safety programs in the wake of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Broward County. It left only $123 million in the housing program. But with the new governor, housing advocates say they are more optimistic about reviving full funding of the state's affordable housing initiative this year. Governor Ron DeSantis recommended $338.4 million for the affordable housing program. That is a, a direct contrast from former Governor Rick Scott, who took $1.1 billion from the housing budget in his eight years in office. Florida uses a dedicated portion of the tax on real estate transactions for affordable housing programs each year. This is where the money goes. Some 70% of the funding goes to Florida counties and cities based on population. The local governments use it to build and rehabilitate affordable housing and to give people financial help for down payments or closing costs. The remainder pays to build and rehabilitate affordable multifamily apartments. Jamie Ross, the president of the nonprofit Florida Housing Coalition said, Quote, when we are talking about the for affordable housing needs, it's from ending homelessness to helping people get into first-time home ownership. It's a whole span, end quote. Nonetheless, lawmakers have raided the housing trust fund for 11 consecutive years. A ho Florida Housing Coalition report last year shows how those funding shifts impact affordable housing availability. After fund shifts between 2009 and 2013, the state was able to help an average of 1,812 households a year. But if the program is fully funded, the report shows that a state can help far more people, some 8,000 to 10,000 households. Ross went on to say, quote, this is a dedicated revenue source for much needed housing to fund excellent programs that are a benefit to everybody in the state. If there is an emergency, if there is a recession, that's understandable, but outside of an emergency, no. There's no reason to take one penny out of the housing trust fund." End quote. Florida Senate leaders have supported full funding for the affordable housing programs, but the State House has supported major sweeps or taking money out of the housing fund and giving it elsewhere for years now. Last year, before Broward County school shooting, House budget writers shifted all the housing money to other state programs, except for a portion targeted for areas impacted by hurricanes Irma and Matthew. Senate Majority Leader Kathleen Pisadamo, a Naples Republican, filed legislature last year to stop the legislature from sweeping, or just plain taking, the housing trust fund money, but it didn't pass. This year, she is supporting a similar bill, SB 70, filed by Senate Senator Debbie Mayfield, a Melbourne Republican. Pasadamo said, quote, I think that 
philosophy is shared by many of my colleagues and hopefully we will be able to avoid sweeping the affordable housing funds and use them because we will need them particularly in the panhandle for redevelopment and rebuilding after Hurricane Michael. End of quote. House Democrats said they support the governor's recommendations to fully fund the affordable housing programs in the next budget year, which begins July 1st. Representative Joe Geller, a Miami Democrat, said, quote, I'm very happy to hear we are not going to be sweeping the affordable housing trust fund, at least as far as the governor's proposal. At home in the counties I represent, that is a very important issue, end of quote. Contact Florida Representative Mike Beltram and Florida Senator Bill Galvano and tell them that they should make the Affordable Housing Fund a top priority. Don't know what to say when you call? Don't worry. We posted a script you can follow on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There you can also find links to their emails. If you don't feel comfortable calling, just copy and paste the script in a message section. Now it's time for the Hillsborough close-up. We live in Hillsborough County, the place, incidentally, with no hills. We do not have enough fire stations for the amount of people we have in Hillsborough County. This is especially true of the South Shore area. Our population is growing and our fire stations are not. It's bad for the population and it's bad for the firefighters. This is an excerpt from an article from the Tampa Bay Times, quote, It's been more than a decade since Hillsborough County fire rescue officials first warned that the county's explosive population growth was outpacing resources for first responders. At a February County Commission meeting, a union officials and do dozens of firefighters sounded the alarm yet again. Travis Horn, a spokesman for the Firefighters Union, told commissioners that, quote, First responders are handling calls at a frenetic pace. They're out day and night, simply building one fire station over the last decade and rebuilding another is not enough to keep pace with the growth we've seen, end quote. To meet the needs of the current population, Hillsborough County would have to build 30 new fire stations, according to Derek Ryan, president of the International Association of Firefighters Local 2294, which, re which represents Hillsborough firefighters. Ryan went on to say, quote, I've been doing this business for 12 years, and I have never seen us gather together before the Board of County Commissioners like we're doing today and begging for resources. We're at that point where we are nervous for the citizens of this county all over Hillsborough County. The biggest need is in North Sun City, an area that requires five new fire stations to meet population growth, end quote. Well, that gives us something to think about. We need five more fire stations right here where we live. We've got one on Sun City Center and one in Apollo Beach, and actually one in Waimama, so we have three. According to Ryan, in 2003, when fire rescue officials first requested funding to build new fire stations, the department received an average of about 80,000 calls for service every year. Last year, firefighters responded to 110,000 calls. Only one fire station was built in that time, an additional station in Fishhawk Ranch area. As Ryan rightfully pointed out, quote, that's crazy. We should have had 20 fire stations within that time frame. We have to keep up with the growth, end quote. This article came from Tampa Bay Times. The South Shore area is growing so fast that the county is not able to keep up with it. And here I am going off script again. Are you both all right with this? Go sure. for it. Merle, you touched on this in the last podcast, but I want to reiterate what you said. Hillsborough County has neglected the South Shore area. Commissioners and administrators focus their attention on other areas of the county. It is, is it because other areas vote and show up to meetings? Could it be that they're, they are politicians? And we know that there are two things that politicians respond to, money and votes. Well, 
money in the form of campaign donations could be a factor. If there is one thing that Hillsborough County could do, it is to it is increase the permit costs of developers. You've heard it here on this podcast before. If you want to increase revenues, make the developers pay higher permit costs like every other county around us. Hillsborough County charges somewhere around $2,000 a house to developers, whereas other counties charge between $15,000 to $18,000 per house. Our surrounding counties are in a better position to pay for new schools and roads that are needed for the new developments. It is common sense. The county doesn't have enough money to pay for the needed improvements. If you look around you, you will see new developments all around us. The developers pick up land cheaply, build and leave the South Shore area. The taxpayers pick up the rest of the costs and that is each and every one of us listening. We need more fire stations and we need better county land use planning so that we will have the revenues to afford more fire stations. I don't know the ratio of stations to the number of houses, but I do know of an island where there were 900 homes and it had a dedicated fire department and trucks to guard their safety. And it was a rural area on top of that. By contrast, we have over 10,000 homes being built here in the South Shore area with two fire stations. The county commissioners have to keep up with the growth in our area or stop the growth until it can afford more fire stations. It is dangerous to not have enough fire personnel. It could be your house that burns down for lack of fire stations. Okay, here's a thought. Maybe we should incorporate Waimama and elect someone to represent us in the county. I do not know the costs and other things that would be affected. We, we are definitely not making an official endorsement either which way. We would have to know exactly what incorporating would mean for us. But one thing is clear. We're not being properly represented and that is a problem. It is also clear that any future developments will need better planning. It is more expensive to install more fire stations now because we didn't properly plan for it as the population was growing. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. If you want to have your neighborhood adequately protected by the Hillsborough Fire Department, then we have to support our fire people by contacting our Hillsborough County Commission. Take a moment and call our representative today. Call our County Commissioner, Stacy White, at 813-272-5740 and tell them we need more fire stations for the number of people in our area. Don't know what to say when you call? Don't worry, we posted a script you can follow on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And don't forget, you can contact all of the commissioners and let them know that the fire station should be a bigger priority. Their contact information is also listed on our social media pages. Let's take a look around the country and world. Today, it's around the country. The Charter School Fund was created in 1994. The Department of Education has dispersed $4 billion of federal funds to start charter schools. The Department of Education has spent $1 billion on fraud and waste in the charter school sector, that according to a report by the New Network for Public Education. Findings of the report were brought to the attention of Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos in hearings during the last week of March. Her responses do not give us a lot of confidence that she took it seriously. She still thinks that there should be more charter schools, not fewer. The report titled To Sleep at the Wheel focuses on seven areas that are wasting taxpayer money. The seven areas are also summarized in a Forbes article by Peter Green that we will be citing throughout this segment. The first is that on how the Department of Education awarded grants to charter schools that never even opened or closed soon after opening. We fell victim to it in Florida too. According to the Network for Public Education, the U.S. Department of Education awarded grants through the charter schools program to 502 Florida charter schools and 37% of them were closed or never opened at all. This includes the Florida Virtual Academy and the University Academy here in Hillsborough County. 
In other words, those Florida charter schools that were closed or never opened received close to $35 million in taxpayer funds. And yet, in 2018, the U.S. Department of Education gave them another $71 million. To offer a very specific example outlined in the report, in 2015, the Innovative Schools Development Corporation pulled in a three-year federal grant for $609,000 to open a STEM school, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. The school promised to enroll 250 students, but it wanted to open in a county that already had 20 charter schools, and enrollment never topped 30 students, nor did it secure the rest of its needed funding. Its charter was revoked before it even opened. The second problem is that charter schools programs grant process does not involve verification of an application's contents. There are countless charters that filed an application touting their intention to serve poor urban students. A quick look at their student demographics would show that their intention is not being followed in the real world. For example, the Mast Community Charter School of Philadelphia, which has a with a 41% low income enrollment compared to 91% low income student population. Repeatedly, applications viewers express misgivings about the reality of an application, but those reservations are not considered at all during the awarding of the grants. The third problem is that grants have been given to schools with barriers to enrollment. Even though they are private schools, charter schools are expected to be open to all students. The report finds that many charters funded by charter school program use policies and practices that discourage or deny enrollment by certain types of students. These barriers can be as simple as the advertising copy from some schools. Idaho's American Heritage Charter School emphasizes patriotism with a dress code that forbids denim and head covering. In other words, no Sikh or Muslim students. Some charters don't provide transportation and require parents to make a financial contribution to the school, thereby boxing out low-income families. Oh, I can speak to that one. My younger brother attended a charter school when he was in fifth grade. It was supposed to be free, but it felt like they were asking for contributions or donations every other second. Yep. And as for how charter schools can be incredibly restrictive, some charters strongly discourage or even turn away students with special needs. A 2016 report by the ACLU of Southern California found illegal or exclusionary practices used by over 200 California charter schools. The fourth problem is that the charter schools program ignored the Office of the Inspector General, or the OIG, which had already pointed out all of the issues outlined in the report we're talking about now. In 2016, the OIG found that the department's internal controls were insufficient to mitigate the significant financial lack of accountability and performance risk that charter school relationships with charter management organizations pose to department's program objectives. The department's noted in response that it doesn't have the resources to monitor how every charter behaves and admission the charter school program is sending taxpayer dollars out into the charter world and simply hoping for the best. Florida, in particular, did not track how much grant funds charter schools drew down and spent. It also allowed for profit management companies to operate charters. The fifth problem is that the department does not exercise sufficient oversight. The OIG has also noted that subgrants, where state education departments hand off money to individual charters, is the point of the worst abuse of the system. The Network for Public Education report determined that things are even worse than the OIG had suggested. Miss Michigan is one example of a state that is wide open to abuse. For instance, ProPublica's Miseducation Project found that at Hope Academy and Grand Rapids with a $550,000 subgrant, non-white students were seven times more likely to receive harsh punishment than white students. Arizona's application for the charter school program grants includes the objective of improving the academic outcomes of educationally disadvantaged students. Yet, an ACLU study 
found a wide pattern or illegal and exclusionary practices to keep those students out of charter schools. Multiple states have been found at various times to be doing a lousy job of handling the federal funds, and yet the charter schools programs does not call for an additional oversight or assur assurances that the state will do better. The sixth problem is that charter schools program grants to charter management organizations are beset with problems. It has become one of the most commonly noted problems of the charter world and the means by which a so-called nonprofit charter still enriches its owners. An entrepreneur sets up a charter school, then hires his own company or family members to provide the critical services for the school while leasing the school building from himself. This type of sweeps contract has plagued charters for the last two decades. Charter schools getting grants from charter schools program are no different and charter schools program has taken no steps to make sure that they are different. The final problem is that as the money level rises, the award equality level drops. The amount of taxpayer money spent by charter school program has increased steadily over the past 25 years regardless of the party in power. The Network for Public Education reports find that the past few years has seen an increase in funding and a decrease in the quality of the school that apply for and receive grants. The department's own reviewers are giving application scores in the low 71.6 out of 108 in one case, and yet the applicants still successfully receive taxpayer dollars for their charter school. None of this is reassuring, and we know that. Governor DeSantis also supports expanding charter schools, as does the Florida House of Representatives. They say it's for low-income students, but after reading the report by the Network for Public Education, we don't have a lot of confidence that the increase in charter schools will actually serve low-income students. And we can reasonably expect that over a third of those charter schools will be closed or never opened at all. This is all to say that one thing is abundantly clear. A huge pile of taxpayer money is going to waste. Here's what we can do about it. The Network for Public Education recommends, essentially, a hold on charter schools program grant process, while the history and current state of guarantees, or grantees, excuse me, is more carefully examined, with an eye to putting more safeguards in place. As Peter Green, author of the Forbes article that summarizes the report, pointed out, that seems like the least the feds could do to provide better oversight of the money involved. Anything that is federally funded should have better oversight than this. As Green said, the price of having a few good charters cannot be hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars simply paid into the void, never to be recovered and never to be used to provide for the service for which they were intended. Contact our representatives and tell them that charter schools should not be expanded until they have proper oversight. Our taxpayer money should not be wasted like this. Contact Governor DeSantis, Representative Beltran, and Senator Galvano because this impacts the state of Florida. And while we're at it, the Department of Education is a federal agency and therefore our U.S. congressmen should do more to make sure that our taxpayer money is not wasted. Contact our U.S. Senators Marco Rubio and Rick Scott and U.S. Congressman Vern Buchanan as well. And again, we posted a script you can follow on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. <laughs> Our next segment and newest edition is All About Science with Debbie. Howdy. I'm Debbie, the New Yorker who retired from teaching middle school math and science in Los Angeles. My claim to fame is that I love to learn and I love to teach. Today's article is a discussion on whether or not to vaccinate. If I didn't give credit for a piece of information, the credit goes to our own Ariba. She did research on this subject for a former project and generously shared her work with me. According to a science journal published by Lander College, people in the 21st century are not aware of the diseases that occur in the undeveloped countries. 
due to the herd immunity through a majority vaccinated population. The diseases are only a plain ride away. They can land in anyone's kindergarten. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, the medical consultant for CNN, says vaccines have prevented 6 million deaths worldwide. The fear of autism is one of the reasons people choose not to vaccinate. Studies include a meta-analysis of 1.2 million children in 2014 show no link between vaccines and autism. A meta-analysis is a combination of many studies with positive and negative results, but the probability comes out closer to the results of no autism. One in a million children have a serious adverse reaction. We all hear about the one in the million, but we don't hear about the million who never get a disease. Autism Speaks is an autism advocacy organization in the United States that has a budget of $47 million for last year. They do research and conduct awareness and outreach activities at families, governments, and the public. In 2017, Autism Speaks has acknowledged that scientists have conducted extensive research over the last two decades to determine whether there is any connection between childhood vaccines and autism. The results of the research are clear. Vaccines do not cause autism. Let's understand how a vaccine works. Vaccines are one of the most important advances in modern medicine. A weakened form of a virus or bacteria is injected into your body, and then your immune system fights it off and memorizes how to defeat the invader. This is called an amnestic response. This is especially useful for diseases with no cure, and prevention is the best medicine. Refusing vaccination for personal or philosophical beliefs creates a shaded area of government intervention with personal rights and beliefs. Where can we draw the line for government intervention? People fear that vaccines can cause brain damage. This stems from a mercury-based preservative, thimerosal, found in some vaccines. There is no evidence to suggest that vaccines cause neurological damage. <laughs> Nevertheless, the FDA and the CDC have made moves to reduce or eliminate all traces of thimerosal in all routine vaccines. In the 1930s, an Australian doctor administered a set of vaccines to the public. His vaccine was contaminated with an infectious bacterium, thimerosal, is a preservative and was added to keep this from happening again. In the 1930s, sanitation methods were not up to today's standards. Preservatives were very necessary, but not now. Some people feel that if children are properly taken out of high-risk infectious situations and taught proper hygiene and anti-contamination techniques, then there would be no more need for vaccine. Obviously, this won't work if you live a public life in stores, schools, parks, theaters, and airplanes. You can't control what others do. My 17-year-old grandson Tristan is a product of social media and informed me of an 18-year-old boy, Ethan Lindenberger, who lives in Ohio. His mother is against vaccinations. Ethan became aware of his awkward situation when he applied to college and they wanted his vaccination records. He worked it out with his mom to agree to disagree, and he is now catching up on his vaccines. He has created a lot of social media activity and can be followed online. Tristan also informed me that Amazon is removing all anti-vaccine media from its shelves. They are making the statement that they are pro-vaccine. Dr. Gupta spent time in West Africa covering the Ebola outbreak, and he saw how people hoped, wished, and prayed for a vaccine, but to no avail. It's a luxury to be having this discussion at all. Keep a lookout for the next podcast when I will be discussing recycling in Waimama and all the facilities that are available to us that a lot of us are not using. Have a good day. Fran is a good friend of mine and a neighbor. Fran taught social studies and more at high school level for 35 years. 
She was so good at her job that at times she still thinks she's teaching and always will be. Now it's time for the Did You Know segment. Hi, I'm Fran. My segment is called Do You Know? In the last podcast, I began an exploration as to reasons why eligible voters don't vote. First, I explained why voters don't think their vote matters. Today's podcast will address that voters don't vote because the ballot is too long and complicated. Many citizens are very busy, and voting is time-consuming. Our last election was an off-year election, a non-presidential election. The ballot included a U.S. Senate race, U.S. congressional seats, governor's race, state cabinet positions, state senators, legislative seats, referendums, etc. The ballot was lengthy. We were faced with information overload from TV ads, mailings, debates, newspapers, editorials, phone calls, etc. It sounds overwhelming. It takes time to understand the issues and the candidates' positions on them. Those who vote determine who wins. If you are passionate about the environment, overdevelopment, affordable housing, health care, jobs, transportation, etc., you need to vote for the candidates who support your issues. You do have time to study the issues for many resources, from the newspapers, TV and radio news programs, attend political party forums and or debates, town meetings, emails from various interest groups, political parties, contact candidates online, research online, and of course our podcast, The Wamama Mamas, etc. It takes time and effort, but in the end, change can happen with your vote. If you vote by mail, you have time to study the ballot before mailing it in. You don't have to wait for election day to vote. You can also vote early, which usually begins two weeks before the election. You can even bring a sample ballot into the voting booth with you. Remember, your vote does make a difference. Here with us today is Hud Richard. He was the past president of the South County Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT. I had the pleasure of taking a class with Hud. Uh, actually, it was my very first class with uh, CERT, and I just had a wonderful time. I learned so much, and I'm really glad to have a Hud here today so we can talk about my favorite organization, CERT. Hi. Good morning to you both. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to talk about, yes, one of my favorite organizations. So I thought I'd first start to give you uh, a basic understanding of what CERT actually is. The Community Emergency Response Team, as we call CERT, program educates volunteers about disaster preparedness for the hazards they may impact their area and trains them in basic disaster response skills, such as fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, and disaster medical operations. CERT offers a consistent nationwide approach to volunteer training and organization that professional responders can rely on during disaster situations, which allows them, the professionals, to focus on more complex tasks. Through CERT, the capabilities to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters is built and enhanced. Some background that I may offer you so that you know exactly where CERT came from. CERT was developed and implemented by the Los Angeles City Fire Department in 1985. What happened was that because of the wildfires that occurred, there were so many volunteers who wanted to do something. Well, without preparation, these volunteers became victims. So. It was developed that there is a training that was offered to the volunteers so that they helped and then become victims. The Whittier Narrows earthquake further on in 1987 underscored the area-wide threat of a major disaster in California. Further, it confirmed the need for training civilians to meet their 
immediate needs. Since 1993, CERT has impacted communities across the country, building essential skills and capabilities to prepare for and respond to any disaster. I underscore the word any because so often here in Florida, uh, we are concerned more with hurricanes. But we also are prepared for other things like tornadoes or other hand, or human disasters be, besides the natural ones. There are now CERT programs in all 50 states, including many tribal nations and U.S. territories, each unique to its community, but all essential to building a core of preparedness. What is the typical thing that a CERT member does on a day, the day after a hurricane or as soon as a hurricane stops? Well, the major focus of CERT, believe it or not, is with your individual family. It is that key piece that we emphasize in our training that your family has to be safe and secure and prepared for the days to come. Then and only then does the CERT responder join with other members of the team to take care of their first and foremost neighborhood, at which point they will do uh, the majority of the training that we've done people, light search and rescue to see who needs help. We offer trauma um, triage to those who are in need. Uh, we set up first aid stations um, uh, for those. Meanwhile, the fire department, for example, can do the other, as we said, more complex things that they would not ordinarily be able to do. In essence, we may be very vital in saving lives where they might be lost. Yes, it's a good organization uh, of how you handle an emergency. Uh, if I remember, we set up blankets, we color-coded victims or people who might be injured, and we staunched bleeding if we had to. I, I haven't yet had that experience, I'm, and I'm glad for it, but I do know how to do these things now. I also know how to do the search and rescue, which is very, very interesting. But you have to learn it the right way, and that's by attending a class at CERT. One thing we were talking about earlier was that, you know, in, in the moment where we have a natural disaster, people will respond to the call, and people will step up and they'll want to help. But the training is very, very important beforehand. As you had mentioned before, people, the way CERT was founded in the first place was because people in Los Angeles wanted to respond to the fires, but they became victims in the process. So how does one become a CERT member? Well, that was going to be the next thing I was going to address. So we're, <laughs> we're all working as a team right here. Uh, as mentioned briefly above, um, this is a course uh, of, for us here, somewhere between 16 and 24 hours, depending upon the size or that is the number of students. Um, because we do a lot of hands-on. Obviously, if there are a lot of students, it takes more time. A smaller class, we will be able to get through more quickly. Um, that course includes a curriculum of six modules. One is the CERT basics. As we said before, basics is the first and foremost family preparation. Secondly, once again, we do some light search and rescue, as we've mentioned before, triage, where we pull out those multicolored cards and, and identify people in the field who need to be treated more or can be part of what we might call the walking wounded, um, set up first aid stations, um, and everybody's trained in all these uh, situations to take care. Um, we also focus on uh, areas of uh, hazardous waste because there might be a trucker coming along 674 in um, Sun City Center or 301 or 674 in Waimama to be able to be uh, identifying these and knowing when to uh, stay away or how to uh, treat them. And then, of course, there is review. Where do we get this equipment to do all this? It's all provided free and it comes from the county. We also have been talking about how there has been cutbacks to CERT and that there is a, a lack of personnel. So what are some things that we can do to address this? One of the things is to um, figure out what your priorities are. There are so many other organizations, worthy organizations in Sun City Center, as there are others. And to choose, uh, once again, where your priority is. 
Uh, CERT is not that demanding only because we only have a, a monthly meeting, but it is important that we come to this meeting um, so that you continue your training. Um, other groups um, that you uh, attend to may require a little bit more, but it's a matter of priorities so that we spread the wealth all around. You and Merle were talking earlier about the Tampa International Airport training. Merle, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It made me look from a different perspective. We played parents, relatives of victims of a possible air crash. We were never actually told. They just said there was a problem with the airplane. And the airport people learned how to handle us uh, as as potential relatives of victims, uh, and we certainly gave them a rough time. <laughs> we wanted them to know that we were parents, and that, that our children were on that plane. They they needed to step up and uh, give us more information. So it was a learning experience for them as well as us. I'm glad you mentioned that because um it shows the respectability that CERT has not only in Sun City Center but as a national national organization. Um, that is uh, responsible so that when, uh, for example, Tampa International has to have its uh, uh, every three years disaster training drill, that they know there's a group that they can invite um, that's very serious about their task. There are other activities that we've been involved in that do not necessarily involve our, um, our training, um, but for example, uh, we work very closely with the Red Cross and on one Saturday morning, we gather with the Red Cross in Wamama, as a matter of fact, uh, to install smoke detectors. And in a span of two hours, we are able to install 317 smoke detectors in the homes of Wamama, simply because we had enough people from CERT who were willing to respond and come out and spend a morning there. That's one, another one example. Um, a second example that of our um, ability to um, work with other groups in Sun City Center is the uh, Sun City Center Emergency Squad, which gave a call out to look for a missing person. That does involve some of our search and rescue skills, and that we would be able to hopefully attend to a person if we found him or her. And in the span of 15 minutes when I put out the call, we got the response of 23 people who are willing to drop everything and go out and look for this person. So it shows once again the, the respectability that CERT has as being a very responsible group that they can call in a moment's notice and get immediate response. We had mentioned that is CERT part of a government agency. And so, you know, you have this national hierarchy which starts with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, but that's at the national level. So how is, what, how is CERT able to attend to the needs of the people in the South Shore area and in Waimama? Yes, we have a, a rather uh, interesting structure. If there were to happen a local disaster, we would what we call self-activate. And we would go um, to where the need is. My mama being right next door to Sun City Center, well, we could be there in a heartbeat, uh, just as we would. Um, we are also uh, sponsored by uh, the Hillsborough County Fire Rescue, uh, which is where we get our uh, direction. Uh, and connections through the state and the federal government. If um, there was a, a, a disaster that uh, they wanted us to attend to, uh, they would then call us out as an activation. I've been part of the EOC during days when we've had activations and had a seat at the table there in Tampa as being the official representative of CERT, uh, where uh, we would have a, a phone line dedicated to CERT sitting right there at the, uh, the EOC. Um, so it would be someplace, the, EOC being what? the Emergency Operations Center. So we would be able to um, uh, respond to a disaster outside our area too at the direction of the county. Amazing, the EOC, how beautiful it is, uh, how, well now they're in a new facility, but even the old facility, mm -hmm. I was very impressed by. It's a very large place, you're locked in, or closed in. Everybody has a desk. Uh, and it's kind of like when they when they send up uh, satellites into the sky, the, sitting there with their phones and what whatever has to be done, and you're all watching what needs what they have. It's, it's very exciting. And know, knowing that this is a life-saving uh, uh, 
effort on the part of the county and that CERT is part of it. It, it really is important. I'd, I'd like to add that when we uh, self-activate, uh, activate, mm -hmm. when we self-activate, um, we did it where I live and uh, the last uh, Irma, uh, all of us met up at uh, this park-like area and we, we already knew our streets. We did our own streets, which makes it even better because you know the people there uh, and you know what to expect. So we went out. I had my street. Just to give you an idea, what we do is we knocked on doors. We looked around. If there was no answer, I'd walk around the house, look in the back because you never know. Somebody could have fallen in their, in their bedroom. I, I even knocked on their, door, their windows to make sure that they were okay. Um, then we put a little piece of tape on the garage door to show that we've done that house and we know that it's safe. Uh, if not, we have a list and we go back to it later on. I'm so happy that you're talking about this uh, uh, individual uh, focus that you had on your community because it highlights that CERT is not really a complicated thing. It's something that everybody can do. And I like to say that because when you consider Sun City Center as a senior community, it's something that we all can do because there is really a place for everyone. Even if you can't go out and do some light search and rescue, uh, you can sit at a table and take down data and information. Uh, you can be part of our communication system. Uh, there are so many jobs that we all can do that, uh, that nobody is uh, left out. We did have uh, an interesting experience with the Big Ben CERT when they had their disaster training. It was fun to be with the kids because they had a teen CERT uh, class during the year. And we came up and participated with them and did some training along with them. Particularly, uh, we did uh, w the new class called Stop the Bleed, uh, which is going to be one of the classes that's going to be quite demanding or the people are going to be a part of. That sounds wonderful. So you, uh, we could start one in Waimama. If there were enough people to get together, they could call you or they could call Waimama Mamas. Just leave it on our webpage. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's right. <laughs> All you have to do is say, I want to start a um, CERT organization in my neighborhood. And uh, we'll be happy to get you give you the right places to go to get started. One thing we were also talking about earlier is the, the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, put out a statistic that said that 40% of small businesses end up going out of business in, after a natural disaster because they don't have proper, a proper disaster plan. And I think Merle can actually speak to this because she had previously owned a small business. And so you want to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, we had a, a small business in, in uh, Los Angeles, California, actually near the center, um, the center point after the 1994 uh, earthquake, or epicenter, I'm sorry, not center point. And um, we walked into our business after that earthquake, and everything was on the floor. Um, the refrigeration was out. It was a food business. Uh, it was... Things were broken. Uh, it was a mess. But the first thing we had to do was pull out all that meat and cheese and chickens and whatever else we had, food, in there because you have to worry about rats after an earthquake. They'll come out and, and swarm your business and it, it'll just ruin your store. So my husband and I actually um, filled the car with meat. In fact, I had, I had it, I was in the passenger side and I had it piled on top of me and we drove around. People were living in um, the parks and uh, we handed out huge hunks of meat and they cooked it because there wasn't any place you could, there was no electricity and it was at least uh, five days, if I remember, that they had to survive and people were afraid to go into their own homes. Uh, so it was quite an experience and it let me know that CERT is needed because we could have been injured and laying there in our house alone and that's why we need CERT. So I want to thank uh, HUD for coming in today. What a great job you do and the public should know about it. And uh, I hope I get a lot of responses on our Facebook page and Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Wanting to know more. Thank you so much, Richard.
Thank you so much for joining us. And I mean, it's information that you don't think about until, you know, it's too late. And we have the opportunity now to prepare. It's been a pleasure to be with you because it's always uh, fun to talk about uh, my, uh, my agency. Uh, <laughs> and yes, uh, I meant, said fun. And yes, we do have some fun uh, in, in all of this because um, we have a great group that, that shares a common bond and interest. That's all for today, Why Mama folks. A special thank you to Hud Richards, past president of the South County Community CERT, for joining us. Keep a lookout for the next podcast on June 16th. And thank you so much for listening. See you all next time on Why Mama Mamas and Papa. Papa.